Hello everyone, uh, my name is Brad Denby from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'm advised by Professor Brandon Lucia and I'll be talking about our work on orbital edge computing and nanosatellite constellations as a new class of computer system. So I'll start with some background on satellite systems by comparing traditional satellites to contemporary nanosatellites. I'll then focus specifically on nanosatellites, uh, which offer new opportunities at the cost of unique constraints on things like sensing, communication, and computing. Uh, to address these constraints, I'll present a collection of orbital edge computing techniques, and I'll conclude with an evaluation of different nanosatellite constellation configurations that leverage these techniques. So as background, satellites typically have been several meters in size, thousands of kilograms in mass, collect kilowatts worth of power, and cost hundreds of millions of US dollars. Uh, if you talk to space system architects, they'll admit that satellite CPUs are 10 to 20 years behind the state of the art. Uh, the justification for this has been a need for high assurance. Uh, these satellites are expensive, and they can be deployed for decades. Uh, to give you an idea uh, for what these satellites tend to have on board, the ESA tends to use LEON CPUs, which were first released in 1997. Many of these CPUs are deployed as soft cores and FPGAs, so their clock frequencies are often capped at hundreds of megahertz. The Mongoose 5 is a MIPS processor that was released in 2000 with a clock frequency of 15 megahertz. NASA used this CPU on its EO-1, or Earth Observing 1, mission, uh, which was their satellite uh, for their flagship artificial intelligence mission. Finally, we have the PowerPC RAD750, which was released in 2001. It has a maximum clock speed of 200 megahertz. It's manufactured using a 150 nanometer process, and it costs 200,000 US dollars per unit. So if you design and launch a traditional satellite today, it's likely to have one of these on board. Uh, but that's the world of traditional satellites. And in the past 20 years, we've actually seen an exponential growth in the launch of nanosatellites, uh, which are orders of magnitude smaller in size, mass, power, and cost. And in just the past five years, we've seen deployment of hundreds of chip scale satellites. These newer, cheaper satellites are more attritable than traditional satellites, which means that it's okay if they break. And as a result, they can be outfitted with more modern hardware because the satellite isn't expected to operate for decades. But in other ways, uh, these nanosatellites are still stuck in the past. So all of these systems, uh, from the large monolithic satellites to the small nanosatellites, share the same essential concept of operation called a bent pipe architecture. Under this system, a ground station sends command and control signals to the satellite on orbit, and the satellite responds by downlinking raw, unprocessed sensor data. So all of these devices are essentially dumb, remote-controlled sensors. Bent pipes have worked well for the past 63 years, uh, but the number of satellites in orbit has increased to nearly 20,000. And more importantly, constellation populations has been growing. Uh, so a satellite constellation is just a collection of satellites that share a purpose. And typically, constellation populations have been on the order of tens of devices. But in the past few years, we've seen populations on the order of hundreds of devices for the first time. And recently, multiple organizations have filed plans to launch new mega constellations uh, with populations on the order of thousands or even tens of thousands of devices. So as a result, the number of satellites in orbit is expected to grow by 300% over just the next decade. This massive shift creates new challenges for constellation management, uh, which I'll cover in more detail towards the end of the talk. So we've seen that nanosatellites are proliferating, uh, which creates new opportunities for new applications like disaster relief, infrastructure monitoring, and public safety. But these new capabilities are hindered by constraints on volume, power, uh, communication, and data quality inside of this tiny nanosatellite form factor. So I'd like to take a closer look at these constraints and how they might be mitigated. Uh, I'll use the Dove constellation as an example for the challenges that nanosatellites face. What you're seeing now uh, is the graphical front end of our custom simulator running at 60 times real speed. Uh, the satellite icons are tracing out the actual positions of the Dove satellites, uh, which are operated by a company called Planet Labs. The mission of this constellation is to image the entire landmass of Earth daily. Uh, this constellation is serviced by a custom ground station system that uses a bent pipe architecture to control the satellites and to downlink the data. Ground stations are clustered at high latitudes in order to maximize communication opportunity per satellite revolution. Using X-Band, uh, this system achieves up to 15 gigabytes of data downlinked per satellite pass, uh, which can last up to 10 minutes. Uh, 
So in order to service each satellite every revolution, a single ground station can service only nine satellites per 90 minute period. If you want to service hundreds or even thousands of satellites this way, it just doesn't scale because you need a huge number of ground stations. Uh, there's some room for improvement here. Uh, for example, you can use deployable antennas, uh, or you can switch frequencies, for example, to KA band in order to get a slightly higher data rate. Uh, but a higher data rate isn't going to solve the fundamental bottleneck of centralized terrestrial communication. As missions move further and further from Earth, uh, there's fewer communication opportunities, higher communication latencies, and lower data rates. And also, all of this communication has to take place using radio, uh, which requires a significant amount of energy. And in space, energy is a limited resource that has to be harvested from the environment. So we argue that the most scalable solution to this problem is to replace a bent pipe architecture with edge computing. Instead of depending on a ground segment to analyze and react to sensor data, we propose that remote sensors process and react to data autonomously at the edge. Uh, however, autonomous edge processing provides useful results only with sufficient data quality. And it's not immediately clear that a tiny volume constrained nanosatellite is capable of capturing data of useful quality. So as an example, consider visual spectrum data. Uh, the figure of merit for satellite images is called ground sample distance, or GSD, and that's shown here on the y-axis. GSD is just the geographic distance represented in an image between the centers of adjacent pixels. So a smaller GSD is better because the image resolves finer details. Given a fixed camera sensor, GSD is determined by two factors, uh, the orbit altitude and the camera focal length. Uh, here we have orbit altitude on the x-axis. So a large Earth observation satellite collects data with GSD on the order of centimeters per pixel, which is pretty good. And the reason for this is that the satellite is able to have a very long focal length. Uh, current 3U nanosatellites collect data with GSD between 3 and 5 meters per pixel. We model three different camera systems uh, that can fit into the nanosatellite form factor by varying the focal length. And what this shows is that uh, while there is some room for improvement compared to existing systems, nanosatellite data quality is fundamentally bounded away from that of larger satellites. Uh, however, we find that machine learning can bridge this fundamental data quality gap. And before I go into the how and why on that, I want to give you a little bit of a better idea for what a visual spectrum satellite image might look like and what this workload entails. So current satellites, uh, both traditional satellites and nanosatellites, capture frames as they pass through their orbit. Um, and these frames might look like something like this on the, on the screen. Those frames are stored on board until the satellite approaches a ground station, at which point as many frames as possible are downlinked, and then the frames are analyzed once they arrive on Earth. Uh, since satellite frames consist of very large geographic regions, different parts of the image may require different analysis. So to support this, images are typically tiled before they're analyzed. Some tiles might simply be labeled according to their content, whereas in other tiles, uh, the feature locations might be extracted. For example, building footprints or the location of cars. So to evaluate whether nanosatellite data quality is useful, uh, we perform machine inference on satellite images with classification and detection networks. Uh, we find that classification and detection remain accurate even as ground sample distance degrades. So here the y-axis indicates accuracy, where higher is better, and the x-axis is ground sample distance. So ground sample distance or data quality degrades from left to right. Inference accuracy on high quality data from large satellites is listed uh, on the left of the graph and inference accuracy on nanosatellite quality data is listed in this band on the right of the graph. This shows that machine learning is robust to poor data quality, and any modest decrease in accuracy is likely going to be acceptable given that nanosatellites are four orders of magnitude cheaper than traditional satellites, and they can provide you with higher temporal resolution uh, due to their greater device count. So the key takeaway here is that accuracy remains consistent as GSD degrades. Uh, but there is another factor uh, that has a much stronger impact on accuracy. We find that for object detection, accuracy varies significantly with tile size. This plot has tiles per image on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. So on the x-axis, tile count increases from left to right, and the more tiles per image, the greater the latency per frame. If we focus in on just one curve, uh, and this curve is typical for a nanosatellite, we can identify an empirically optimal tiling scheme for accuracy. Uh, but this tiling scheme has a really high latency of 138 seconds, uh, 
even with acceleration on a GPU. So to avoid missing data, we need to leverage some sort of additional domain-specific latency optimizations here. So to summarize, um, we've seen three major constraints faced by nanosatellites, uh, a downlink bottleneck, uh, limited data quality, and high processing latency. To address these constraints, I'm going to introduce a collection of orbital edge computing techniques. As a reminder, uh, existing systems are essentially dumb remote controlled sensors. Uh, so in order to support edge computing, we introduce onboard machine inference accelerators. In this work, we evaluate orbital edge computing with a Jetson TX2 compute module. Uh, this system contains an onboard mobile GPU, which draws power comparable to Flight Heritage X-band transceivers, and it's been shown to remain effective in the space radiation environment. However, continuous operation of the Jetson is impossible uh, because it consumes more power while performing inference than provided by the solar panels. So this has the potential to worsen the high latency that we saw previously if the satellite periodically has to shift into a low power mode in order to replenish its energy buffers. It also means that these devices are fundamentally limited by harvested power and any unnecessary power overhead is going to further reduce performance. So with this in mind, we evaluate a capacitor-based energy storage system. Uh, low Earth orbit is one of the most adversarial environments for batteries. For example, in order to prevent the batteries from freezing while the satellite is in eclipse, they have to be heated, uh, which incurs a power overhead. Capacitors avoid this power overhead because they don't need to be heated in eclipse. And they do have a lower energy density than batteries, but we show that once sufficient energy storage has been provisioned to complete tasks and make forward progress, a larger energy buffer provides no performance benefit for periodic workloads. In our evaluation of orbital edge computing, we apply machine inference to ground track frames. So on your left, I show two ground track frames. Uh, in this illustration, each ground track frame is split into four tiles. And each tile is then resized before using a neural network for onboard inference. We evaluate uh, two neural network workloads, an image classification workload and an object detection workload. These workloads have different average power consumption and processing times. Uh, but the, inter the most interesting feature here is their data volume implications. Uh, classification labels tiles as interesting or not interesting, uh, which means that the useless tiles can be discarded. Detection draws bounding boxes around features, which can then be downlinked as GPS coordinates at a very low data volume compared to the full frames. So this enables intelligent early discard of, youth of useless data in order to reduce data volume. Next, I'd like to introduce another technique to reduce data volume. Uh, this technique takes advantage of the fact that satellites have predictable, well-defined orbits. So as an example, uh, consider a nanosatellite with a 4K camera in a 400 kilometer altitude orbit. Uh, this satellite is going to have a ground track velocity of about 7.2 kilometers per second. It'll have a GSD of about 3 meters per pixel. And that means it sees an entirely new geographic region uh, with its camera every 1.7 seconds. Using GPS, a uh, nanosatellite can be configured to collect images at this ground track frame rate. And importantly, sampling at the ground track frame period results in a processing deadline, uh, which here conflicts with the high processing latency that we saw earlier whenever you're tiling for maximum inference accuracy. So this leads to a natural figure of merit for nanosatellite constellations called the ground track coverage. Uh, ground track coverage is the fraction of ground track frames that a constellation captures and processes per revolution. So this 1.7 second processing deadline is much less than the 138 seconds per frame that we saw previously. And so in order to meet this deadline, we introduce computational nanosatellite pipelines, or CNPs. Uh, this is just a convoy of satellites that are all in the same orbit and observe the same ground track frame in sequence. Each satellite uses GPS to capture ground track frames and process a subset of tiles or frames based on its ID in the constellation. So long as the convoy is deep enough, each individual satellite will be responsible for a few enough tiles that processing completes within the deadline and ground track coverage reaches 100%. We evaluate four different CNPs, uh, four different CNP configurations along two dimensions, a processing distribution dimension and a data distribution dimension. Data processing can be done in tile parallel where each frame is processed by multiple satellites, or it can be done in frame parallel, where each frame is processed by a different satellite. Data distribution 
determines which satellite has access to what data at what time, and the lever that determines data distribution is the physical distance between the satellites. So when satellites are close-spaced, all of the satellites have access to the same data at the same time, uh, and when satellites are frame-spaced, each satellite has access to different data at different times. To conclude, uh, I'll present our findings when evaluating these different configurations. So let's first take a look at the tau parallel configurations. Uh, when close spaced, all satellites observe a ground track frame simultaneously. So as the population grows, the average system latency, uh, the average system frame latency decreases because each res uh, satellite is responsible for less work. When frame spaced, satellites access a particular ground track frame far apart in time. So the first satellite observes a ground track frame much sooner than the last satellite in the convoy. As population grows, this separation begins to dominate and the system frame latency increases. Uh, the takeaway here is that if you're doing tile parallel processing, a close space configuration is necessary in order to get that low latency. Next, I'd like to take a look at frame parallel configurations. Uh, when close spaced, one satellite images a ground track frame while all of the other satellites process previously collected frames. When frame spaced, uh, the same behavior occurs a satellite observes a ground track frame and then processes all of the tiles. So these configurations lead to uniformly high average system frame latencies. Uh, the takeaway here is that for frame parallel processing, the physical location of satellites uh, relative to each other doesn't affect the system frame latency. Now that we've seen latencies for each configuration, I want to take a look at ground track coverage. Uh, a close spaced tile parallel constellation provides the lowest latency, which we saw a couple slides ago. But in that case, every single satellite has to operate its camera over every single frame. On the other hand, frame parallel constellations capture each frame exactly once across the entire constellation. So these devices are energy constrained, which we saw earlier. And the energy for the extra camera captures ends up reducing ground track coverage. Energy that could have been spent on processing is instead consumed by more frequent camera use. In this case, both constellations achieve full coverage with about 200 nanosatellites, uh, which is comparable to the population of existing constellations. So that's a quick overview of some of the results in our paper. Uh, and before I finish up, I want to take a look forward at some of the emerging opportunities that uh, we see in this area. Traditional space systems uh, are 10 to 20 years behind the state of the art in terms of processing hardware. And I think that this community is well positioned to help move satellites back into the future in this area. Uh, we may soon see as many as tens of thousands of new satellites launch into orbit in just the next 10 years. So I, it would be a, a massive missed opportunity if all of these new satellites end up with 15 megahertz MIPS processors on board. Looking forward, uh, we see several opportunities for nanosatellite constellation research. Uh, energy efficient accelerators can greatly reduce the constellation population needed for full ground track coverage. But these accelerators will need to be evaluated for architectural vulnerabilities to the space radiation environment. As the number of constellations proliferate, we see opportunities to reclaim satellite idle time and schedule work within energy and processing constraints. If you'd like to know more, uh, please read our full paper, uh, which also has a software artifact. And I'd also encourage you to visit our website and try out our open source uh, satellite constellation simulator.